Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have Kevin Hale with us. Kevin, thanks for coming on the program. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, Kevin, you are the Senior Product Manager at SurveyMonkey, um, a company that many of us are familiar with. Uh, but you actually were at a different company before that that you co-founded, which was Wufu, um, another pretty popular company. And you guys were acquired in 2011. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about Wufu for a little bit because uh, a lot of the work you've uh, done at SurveyMonkey kind of began there, right? Um, so what kind of growth did Wufu achieve before it was actually acquired in 2011? Uh, it, in the beginning years, I think it was pretty steady growth, but by the time we got acquired, um, we had been doing it about five years. We were up to 500,000 users, and in terms of the forms and the reports that we were serving out to people, whether they knew, knew they were powered by Wufu or not, it covered about two to five million people. Wow. You know, when you say you have 500,000 uh, registered users, you know, you think about Facebook has, you know, a billion or so, give or take, but you guys are doing forms. I mean, this isn't a social network, and you have half a million users. I mean, that's incredible, right? Yeah, and then just in the last two years, um, I think we're getting close to a million users now. So, like, in the first five years, it you know, it took us about 500,000, and in the last two years, we've doubled that almost. Yeah, that's, so. that's insane. Um, there's also a, a graph that you publish online that talks about uh, how much uh, fundraising you guys raised as opposed to how much uh, revenue you guys have. Um, so if people have a chance, they should go check that out because you guys har had hardly any initial investment, and yet you did a lot better than other people with a lot more money, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, we raised... Uh, $18,000 from Y Combinator, <laughs> we were one of the first Y Combinator classes, and then we only raised $100,000 from two angels. Yeah. Um, and then after that, we never raised another round of funding. We were profitable nine months later after we showed our first prototype at Demo Day, mm -hmm. and we just never needed anyone's money. And so. Yeah, it's a great success story, and that's why I'm going to be really interested in kind of uh, behind the scenes what made that happen. Because what happened at Wufu is very unusual. Um, it is not the norm in so many ways. Now, in 2008, uh, Jacob Nielsen named Wufu one of the top 10 user interfaces for the web. Um, this is quite an accolade. Uh, Jacob Nielsen, when they you know bestow that on somebody, it's very meaningful. Um, this was an interface that was primarily created by you. Is that correct? Yeah. At the time, there was only the three founders still. Mm -hmm. uh, so. My responsibility on that was most of the marketing stuff and the user experience design. Yeah, perfect. So let me ask you this. How important do you think the user interface is in general for user adoption and user retention and all those kinds of growth metrics? I'm actually mixed on this. I mean, as a, a designer, I have a certain level of taste, so I like my apps to look and feel a certain way, and I have a high level sort of like aesthetic expectations for the apps. But I actually think the success of an app um, has less to do with just the looks, but the iteration and the commitment to users over time. So I believe it's, it's much more than just sort of the look and feel. I think mm -hmm. you have to spend a lot of time iterating over time and spending time like in front of users and getting it to a place where you get a perfect sort of match, like yeah. any kind of sort of relationship. Like I, I don't think you hit the nail on the head on your first go ever. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, online, you were quoted as saying, uh, quote, what most people don't know is that designing software that looks good is often the easy part. The real trick is designing software that is both effortless to use and highly profitable. Most of the great software you see is the result of endless iteration guided by good data, end quote, <laughs> right? Um, I love that, uh, that phrase, that, that uh, quote there. Um, so tell us, you know, at the end of it, you say great software you see is a result of endless iteration guided by good data. Um, what is good data? Uh, because that kind of speaks to that process you just uh, talked about. Right. So you can get in trouble in terms of like if you're just collecting data willy-nilly and then you sort of have a hypothesis of what you sort of want um, your app, sort of the direction of it to go, or you have whatever sort of personal sort of agenda for like the design and stuff and so it's easy for people to sort of justify decisions that they want to sort of make so mm -hmm. the trick is making sure that um, if you run A-B tests or multivariate testing that you do things in a way that you get to good confidence uh, scores and intervals that you are testing the right sorts of things and that these are things that are backed up by sort of the vision of the apps because a lot of a lot of the times um, 
you can say, well, this is something that is questionable, or this is something, hey, we could easily test this. And then you go through the test or what have you, and then ultimately what the test will show you is that you can do something that is not aligned with sort of your brand or the ultimate vision of the app and stuff. Mm -hmm. And just because the numbers show that it's better doesn't ultimately mean it's um, something that you should pursue. So there's been a number of times that we've been shown that we've done a couple of tests and it ended up being like, well, okay, the data shows this, but this doesn't really work for us, so we're going to end up not going with this anyway, even though it shows that this definitively is gotcha. going to work on the metric, just because it didn't feel right in terms of how it's going to be used. Yeah. So sometimes good data is just about making sure you're looking at it with good eyes. I gotcha. So it's not just, you know, the metrics rule everything. It's that you have a vision for your company, and the metrics have to support that but they don't lord it over that brand and that vision and the long-term values and goals of what you're creating. Uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what tools do you use to get good data? Um, you know, everyone has their kind of toolkit of apps they prefer or ways they prefer to get data. What are some of the things in your workflow that you actually use to get this good data? Gotcha. Um, so the, some of the easiest stuff that we do in the early stages is just um, – one-on-one, -on -one, like, user testing. So we've used usertesting.com. We've used Silverback, um, which is a desktop Mac software. Um, and a lot of it is really, really simple, just sitting people in front of the interface that have never experienced it before and just watching them go through the stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Silverback's nice because it does, like, video recording. User testing is nice because you can do remote testing from large sort of audiences and then also assign tasks that aren't influenced by you actually being there mm -hmm. in presence. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of sort of analytics that are tracked on our side, we use a lot of internal tools, and um, we have a very interesting customer su support focus sort of design process. And so a lot of the stuff that we have to design around is tracking um, how self-serve components are being used, so like how often tooltips are being accessed or used or utilized, um, where people are, are falling through the cracks in terms of customer support or having problems with the issues, and that leads them to customer support. Um, and then in terms of like typical sort of product design stuff, um, in the early days we used Google Analytics like anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, at SurveyMonkey, because of the scale uh, at which they sort of operate, we have to use some enterprise level tools. So we use Splunk and SiteSpec, which are both sort of things that you install on the server end here. But I've also used um, Optimizely and mixed panel and um, segment.io to sort of help piece a lot of those things together. And those also work really well. Really well. But yeah. For the most part, like, I try to keep the tool sets and processes really, really simple. Like anything that I'm trying to look for, I want to um, get to a decision really quickly. And so it, it's a matter of uh, not spending too much time on building the experiments. It's making sure I'm spending time actually fixing bugs and getting to the process there. So we always try to do the minimal amount of testing possible. So you mentioned customer support um, just now, and you know you have some interesting views on customer support. Um, interesting in how deep it really runs uh, in the culture at Wufu and SurveyMonkey. And let's start with the whole idea of first date. Uh, you give presentations where you talk about the first interactions between the UI and the user is like a first date. What do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah. So when we first started building out Wufu, we um, knew we didn't want to build any kind of software. We wanted to build this software that people wanted to have a relationship with. And that was because we just kind of like understood that people are social creatures and they can't help but create relationships with the things they interact with over and over again, whether that's a brand, the cars you drive, um, the software that you use, or the clothes that you wear. Mm -hmm. And so we figured that it was going to be important for us to sort of help shape and be um, – proactive about how that relationship developed. So we actually looked into the research of how relationships work between human beings and we literally tried to just sort of copy them and try to create processes to sort of mimic that to sort of build a good strong brand. Mm -hmm. So um, the research that we looked at was how sort of first dates and first impressions work and, and relationships first start and then how sort of existing relationships work over time. And so when it comes to like first dates, uh, there's something about them that makes things like really, really special in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So if I ask you to tell me about your first kiss 
or how you propose to your wife or like, your first date. Like those are stories that, that you have on the tip of your tongue and they're the ones you tell over and over and over again. They're the origin story of a relationship and they're actually the word of mouth story of every kind of relationship that you sort of have and it's sort of the ones that you tell about your brand. So um, for an example, if you're like on a first date with someone and uh, they start like picking their nose, for instance, and you are watching them do that, that's probably going to be the end of the date because mm -hmm. your expectations for the day are so high. But if you're married to someone for like 30 years or what have you, and they're on the parking lounge, and they're like digging for gold, you don't immediately like call your lawyer and file for divorce, right? <laughs> yeah. There's something else that happens over sort of the structure of a relationship that helps you sort of give people the benefit of the doubt. So for us, we knew that. First impressions were always going to be part of like the funnel process in the typical sort of web development sort of um, workflow for customer development. Mm -hmm. So what we did, we say, all right, we'll look at all the places where people like first experience our brand, our company, our app. And so the typical things are like your homepage, your landing pages, your advertisements, and things like that. But I think what makes the biggest difference between people in terms of like people saying like I had a remarkable first date, there's people going the distance, and so and beyond, we also looked at stuff. the first emails, the first time you ever see any part of the interface, the login link. Like we go down to granular details, like the first time you see any part of the app, can we do this in a way that it's going to be remarkable that people can say like, oh, at least they thought about me in this way, or you know they did this little thing and it just showed me that they cared. So. Yeah, you mentioned a login link there. Uh, and that's a, that's a cool one because of the way Wufu did it. So tell us about the login link at Wufu. <laughs> yeah, so if you see it uh, on our homepage, um, the login link has a little dinosaur next to it just to sort of highlight that it's going to be But when you hover over it, there's like a little tool that, that pops up and says, RAR! <laughs> and the whole point of it is just to like set a different set expectation of like, this is going to be your experience coming into the app, or this is going to be your experience every single day, and this is going to be different for you. Like, this is going to be software, even though it's basically a database app at its core, that's not going to remind you that you work in a cubicle and that you have a boring office job. You're going to have some kind of software that's going to sort of try to delight you in some aspect. Yeah, and dinosaurs have nothing to do with the product, right? I mean, there's no connection whatsoever. <laughs> Just having to do with our interest. So you'll also find dinosaurs, uh, of all different kinds, Shakespeare quotes, ninjas, robots, basically things that 12-year-old um, uh, uh, boys like and weird um, people who own libraries. Yeah, there you go. No, that's great. And, you know, those little things, do you think they actually affect the bottom line? Like at the end of the day, does a dinosaur saying rawr at me when I log in for the first time do little you know tidbits of Shakespeare and Ninja. I mean, do you think you can actually say, yeah, like we make more money and we have a brand and we have growth in some way because of that, or are they just uh, extras, complete extras? <laughs> I well, I think you have to always get the fundamentals right, the core part mm -hmm. of the experience. I think you can't do any of these other little touches unless you get that part right. Yeah. So if you get that wrong, then all of those little things are going to make people feel like you're focusing on the wrong things. But uh, the fact gotcha. that we get our fundamentals correctly and always this polished step of the little things that try to delight people are the last things we work on mm -hmm. helps people feel like, wow, they went the extra distance rather than, oh, they're trying to put makeup on a, on a pig. Yeah. And in terms of it affecting the bottom line, I like to think so, but I've never run an app that works or operates any other kind of way, so I couldn't actually give you a direct comparison. Yeah. But I do know that it does not affect our bottom line in terms of we have tons of enterprise clients, mm -hmm. people and brands of all different shapes and sizes and we operate internationally on a global scale and we've never had or lost a client as a result of us looking odd or trying to be a little bit too much fun. I think if you think about it in terms of like real human relationships, people who work inside of these larger organizations, companies, they're actual people. <laughs> and people want to interact with software and with a team that they know is going to be kind of fun, has a sense of humor, sort of really gets them and is thinking about them in an interesting way rather than thinking about them as just another sort of line item on a spreadsheet. Yeah, and you know, speaking to the fun kind of aspect of everything, uh, how'd you actually come up with the name Wufu? <laughs> oh, uh, we had some friends who, um, in our Y Combinator class, and he wrote a, a, a site called Instant Domain Search, and he gave us a list of like five-letter uh, domain 
wings that were available. And the one that stuck out of me was one that had uh, two components of bands that I really loved at the time, which was Wu-Tang Clan and Foo Fighters. And I said, like, <laughs> this is it. This is one that, you know, calls out to me. And in the beginning, one of my co-founders actually didn't like the name. Mm-hmm. And he was just like, I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird and no one knows what it means or what have you and stuff. But he mentioned it to his girlfriend at the time, and about a week later, he like calls her back and says, "Hey, do you remember that name that we're like tossing around trying to think of?" Just like I think it was called Wufu and stuff. And he's like, "Okay, I'm sold. <laughs> you no, that's remember awesome. so long." So, and it's just great to see how you've built a company there with Wufu, um, doing so many things that people don't do. You know, with dinosaurs and robots and a name like Wufu, you broke all the rules, and yet you were allowed to, and it actually helped you because you got the fundamentals right. Um, so I love that point you made that if you if you put this polish on without the fundamentals, then you become a joke. If you put the polish on with the fundamentals, you become clever. Um, and, and that's really, it, it's a differentiator. Now, going back to support again, uh, you guys, I don't know if you coined this phrase or if you just adopted it, but you guys uh, were proponents of something called support-driven design and support-driven development. Um, explain that idea to us. What does it mean to have a support-driven design or development kind of culture? I gotcha. Um, I mean, Chris Ryan and I were starting a company, and then we were start getting to the process of hiring people. We were trying to think of, like we did with our app, like how can we run and build up this company in an interesting way as well? And is there some kind of insight that we can have that can sort of make this different? And at the time, all three of us had been doing all the customer support for Wufu for the first like two years of the app. And we knew that that experience completely transformed us, both in terms of like our attitudes towards building software, but how we maintain the quality of the software, how we design and build things, and how it affected every part of the process of how we sort of think about running the company. And we, we noticed that in other companies that we had talked to, um, that there's this broken feedback loop between the people who build the product and the people who have to support it. And a lot of times what ends up happening is, especially with technical co-founders, you get to the stage where you finally have some money and what you want to do is get back to this place where you were before you had any users, the pure sort of creation step where everything you do is something new and you're building something from scratch. And as builders, that is a really appealing stage. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is once you start getting users and you get revenue, what you do is you try to divide and conquer and you try to have other people take care of the stuff that you don't want to have to deal with. And, and what's on the end, list is usually customer support. From the very thing that actually can make your app great. Mm-hmm. And we, this was backed up by uh, lots of different research. Um, Jared Spool over at User Interface Engineering, he did a study where he talked about like exposure hours to uh, interface teams actually directly affects um, the quality of the app software. And if you don't have this direct exposure with customers, um, I think it's like at least two hours every six weeks. Uh, um, you end up having your software get worse over time. <laughs> so we said, okay, if the feedback loop is the problem, is that the people who build the stuff aren't going to do the customer support or what have have you, and, and we want everyone to have an understanding of that. Um, the problem seems to be a sense of humility. Like the people who build the stuff feel like they're too good for this stuff. Mm. And too good to get the insights, and then the people that are building or using their stuff is like doing it wrong. And so we said, we need to make sure there's a sense of responsibility, accountability, and humility, especially in the process of software development. So we said, all right, we're going to just add two things to it. And the first thing was everyone in our company does customer support. And support-driven designer development, it, it's real, that's exactly that simple. Um, and it's no different than other sort of agile practice, which are meant to like build software in a quick way, but also maintain a high level of quality and let you be flexible. So whether it's your agile practices with Scrum or what have you, or test-driven development, all of that's meant to do is like, how do I build stuff so that it's high quality when it goes out to the users, mm-hmm. and, but also lets me be flexible? And so our feeling was like, well, if you just have everyone have to do the customer support, and you make sure that you have sort of a continuous deployment process where you're constantly pushing stuff out to fix the things as you're like helping people, then your QA costs go way down, um, your understanding and empathy with the user goes way up, and then people start thinking about software in a different way when they're building it. So, for example, you just have processes that come out like um, 
when we go through design reviews, like, hey, this is missing tooltips, right? There's not stuff in the interface that helps people out, or people are very cautious about adding new interface elements because it's like, okay, how do I add this without being confusing? We don't announce any software unless there's good documentation for it. We constantly build screencasts for it. And it's part of the people who build the build the software that are now responsible for those things. And it turns out there's like some really nice side effects that we've discovered. So in a culture or in a company culture where everyone is responsible for doing customer support, whether you're a designer, uh, developer, or engineer, or even the bookkeeper or the founders, if everyone's doing customer support, what ends up happening is the support that you give is the very best support that can possibly be given. Yeah. And it's because the people who built the stuff are the most knowledgeable. They know the best places to fix the stuff and they'll be able to help people in a really sort of intimate way that is also extremely knowledgeable to the users. Mm -hmm. Of course, in order to have a culture that works like that, you have to hire for a specific type of in individual. Um, I would say many engineers, especially out here in Silicon Valley, would like doing things the way we do just mm -hmm. because like, they're not people person. They don't feel like it's their job to sort of like interact with users. And um, they, they wouldn't find a home in sort of our environment. But the ones who are willing to sort of take a chance and, and like buy into the process realizes how much more rewarding it is. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing is this direct connection with users. People start seeing it's like, oh, the work that I do actually has extreme meaning. And they start to immediately see the contributions that they make have direct impacts both to the bottom line of, of the company but in terms of just like satisfaction in their own work mm -hmm. because they're really helping people um, and seeing the fruits of the sort of labor yeah no and you know it's interesting because right now um, it's all the the rave of this you know customer development you know the lean startup is all about customer development getting out of the building talking to customers but it's almost like with you know with support driven design and support driven development you're doing customer development all the time, nonstop, 100% of the time, right? Yeah, it's exactly. Like our developers at the time were getting four to six hours of direct customer experience every single week. Yeah. And so it's hard. It's really easy when we have our scrums to say, oh, what's the next thing we should be doing? It's like, well, oh, I have these four ticks, you know, bug stuff that I have to fix right away. Or like, these are what our users are constantly asking us, and this is what we should build. And you don't have to spend like a certain do a usability study or we have to like dive into the stuff like you don't have a separate process like everyone is just in tune mm -hmm. and then we just can get started right away which is sort of um, really efficient surprisingly yeah. and it turns out uh, we had a four and a half day work week at Wufu and so the half day was where we pushed off all our meetings and stuff on Friday. So mm -hmm. we had four days dedicated development, but developers for the first couple of years at Wufu had one of those days dedicated support. So we were building incredible numbers of features with developers only being assigned to three days worth of development a wow. week and then one day doing customer support. And some people might say, like, that might make me really inefficient. But I'm telling you, I would put our team against any team out there. And you can see it in terms of the Jacob Nielsen sort of reward. Like yeah. we were a three person company at the time and we beat out other teams with large usability budgets. Yeah. And a lot of it had to do with just we were extremely in tune with the user and we constantly iterated to sort of match and fix those issues to delight them as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, so far, you know, you're very product driven. I mean, that's obvious. Um, you talk about the core of the product having to be right. And, you know, that's a part of growth. You know, growth isn't just something you do after the product. It is the product. It's everything you do. And so this, you know, support-driven design and support-driven development, it essentially leads to growth when it's done right because your product's improving. And when the product improves, that allows you to have real growth. And then you can put the cool login, you know, Trinosaurus Rex as the extra. But I think this is actually the fundamental thing that's driving the growth, you know? I mean, would you disagree with that? No, for the first four years of Wufu, when you see sort of our growth curve, um, we didn't spend any money on traditional marketing, advertising, or what have you. All of it was through word of mouth. And I, I'm going to say, like, word of mouth happened because people's experience with us and then the help that they got, if they ever had any kind of issues, helped solidify, like, oh, these guys are people that we can trust mm -hmm. and sort of manage and, and work with. And yeah, I don't know. It's, I think... We didn't focus on growth. We didn't have like a growth team or what have mm -hmm. you. Like we were like, okay, we'll do everything that we can to make sure that 
customer support grows at a very maintainable sort of linear level, which is very different from the graph of our user growth. And yeah. so you focus on all these admin tools and all these self-help processes to make things work. And then we say, like, if we do the right thing and we focus on the right stuff, the growth just happens. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of, it, it worked out that way. And yes, that takes like a big leap of faith, mm -hmm. but I believe like our company culture was so happy and it was such a delight to run that kind of company. Mm -hmm. And it was really satisfying both in terms of like work satisfaction, but also in terms of like work-life balance where you feel like, you know, I'm not building stuff to try to trick people into buying things. Like our customer support was to the level where we would keep track of what our competitors were doing. And so if a user was asking us for a feature that we didn't have and we knew it wasn't on the product roadmap or what have you anytime soon, we tell them like, sorry, we don't have this feature right now, but here's a competitor. We know their team. They are a really good group of people and they have a feature that you're looking for. We highly recommend that you give them a try and you know, let them know that we sent you. And you know, hopefully whenever we build out this feature, maybe you might want to be added to a mailing list of like when this gets developed and whenever we build it out, well, you know, let you know. Yeah. More times than not, these people never even left. Mm -hmm. And then when we had this sort of mailing list of every feature that we developed, we'd have this mailing list set up to say, oh, we know these people were looking for this feature. We'd let them know proactively. And they'd be like, wow, that's amazing. You guys, like, delivered on this thing that, you know, I wasn't even sure you were going to build out. Yeah. Know, so. What a great story. That's awesome. Um, now, as much as you focus on product, you also do have a knack for kind of the – the pure marketing stunts, I think, as well, because um, I looked online, and at one point, you guys gave away a battle axe, is that right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tell so me about that. A couple of years ago, we wrote, we wrote our API, because we really wanted Bluetooth to become a platform for like form development stuff, and, and this was the third version of API, and it was based on REST principles, and uh, we thought, okay, this is going to be like really, really great, and we want people to build apps on top of it. We felt pretty confident about it. Mm -hmm. But we're like, well, how do you get people to do that? How do you get people to take a chance and build on top of your code? And um, we heard some companies doing API contests, and we thought, uh, most of them, they just got out like iPads or iPhones at the time, and it, it didn't feel like a woo way of doing stuff. <laughs> and uh, so we're trying to think of an enchanting way, and it turns out, like, in our company, our, the founders are big sort of medieval fanatics, and like for the anniversary of our company, we take everyone to medieval times, for instance, and we thought maybe we can do something along those lines in terms of our interests. So we contacted some people over at Armor.com, and we said, we have uh, a picture of this battle axe that we would like build. Can you custom forge this for us? And it's like, oh yeah, that, we'd be delighted to do that. So we had them build this and we blogged and tweeted about it and we said, okay, for this API contest, if you win first place, you will win this custom forged battle axe. And <laughs> it's one of those things where, again, like the first impressions of it, people saw it and were like, holy crap. And the, and the word of mouth spread really, really far. And it's one of those things where you can't help but want to kind of work on this kind of API contest because you get to tell other people, it's like, I got to work on this code because I could win a giant medieval weapon as a result of it. And so, yeah, it's really great. And we had like 25 great submissions. We got things like an iPhone app, a WordPress plugin, um, an Android app, like all these great stuff that for the cost of running this API contest, we could not have gotten other teams to build for us in the time scale that we had run it. So. It was not something where we were thinking of marketing for the API contest. But we were trying to think of like what would actually get us to want to do this and what would get us to want to tell the story. Mm -hmm. of Which is the best marketing. We looked at our interests to try to figure it out rather than trying to look at like what's something gimmicky we could try to figure out to do. And um, obviously, we did not have a sort of legal personnel or counsel on our team when we handle that stuff. So <laughs> we didn't even think about liabilities at the time. But... Uh, thankfully here at SurveyMonkey, they've got legal counsel here. So if we ever do anything ridiculous in the future, they said, like, we will help you out. Just make sure you tell us. Yeah, I can see you now. You know, let's do a battle axe. They're like, uh, no. <laughs> um, no, they actually, SurveyMonkey is actually really great about understanding our culture a lot. Mm -hmm. And so they, they said, just, like, talk to us and we can help do it in a way that we <laughs> liability. I'll give you one great story about SurveyMonkey, like, Please. really understanding Wufu. Uh, when we first got acquired, one of the first objective or goals was to help internationalize Wufu. And we wanted to, our first language we wanted to do was Spanish. So we were building out Wufu Espanol. And in Wufu, in all these different parts of the app, we have all these Shakespeare quotes, some of my favorite Shakespeare quotes. They're kind of like, uh, 
align with sort of what's going on in the app. Mm -hmm. And when we were going through the localization process, I said to um, the VP of internationalization here, I'm not so sure that translating these Shakespeare quotes to Spanish is going to really work that well for the other cultures. It's not going to give them the same sort of feel. And she was like, yeah, I know what you mean. I was like, maybe we could use like uh, literature from their own language that's sort of really impactful and, and do that. And so we came up with the idea of using Don Quixote. I knew quote. that's what you were going to say. <laughs> and so that worked out really well. But the thing about what Serving Monkey did was the very next day I come into work and and – they come to me and they say, okay, Kevin, we have scheduled an appointment with you with a Don Quixote scholar over at San Jose University, and you'll talk with him, and he's going to, like, get all the quotes for you. And we also noticed that you have, like, 80s band, like, journeys, band lyrics for some of the text examples in Wufu. So he's going to find an 80s Spanish band to also, like, use the lyrics for. And I was like, okay, different level of budget. That's it up here. But they totally embrace sort of, like – our culture and how we sort of do things at Wufu. So, you know, they've been an awesome partner. In this. That's great. Well, let's talk about Survey Monkey a little bit here. Um, when you guys came on board, one of the things, tell me if I'm wrong, that you were tasked with was kind of redesigning the, sur the survey creation experience. Is that right? Yeah. So, and, um, yeah, so tell me a little bit about that. Um, tell me about that process a little bit. Yeah. So, um, I ran two teams, so I continued running the Wufu team, and then we started building on this project to redesign SurveyMonkey's uh, survey creator, and they call it Create. So the new system was going to be called New Create. And what's uh, interesting is that the old Create is was initially designed in like 1999. So there's a lot of legacy and a lot of crust for it, and we were rewriting it from .NET to Python, and we were going to use whatever JavaScript libraries and whatever fancy techniques for it. Um, we have just I think last week launched, I think two weeks ago, we launched an A-B test of the old versus new systems. They're going side by side mm -hmm. uh, right now. So it's too early to say um, how things are going to sort of play out, although we're doing pretty well in terms of the new create. The biggest goals for the app was to design the app so that it didn't disrupt sort of the giant user experience. So we couldn't like completely go in left field to sort of build something new. We had to do something in line with help people gradually get on board onto the app. But the biggest thing we wanted to do was simplify the process because um, SurveyMonkey has tons of question types that they've added over time, and a lot of the times it's gotten very confusing. So my job was a lot of times like working with the copy editors and writers to try to figure out like what is some language and terminology that makes these things a lot more self-evident and how we condense these, this code so it's a lot easier for the user. So I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. um, SurveyMonkey has this question type called the matrix of drop-down. So it's, a, it's rows and columns but all of like a bunch of drop-down menus. And it's actually sort of like, it, for a person that's filling out a form, it's a nightmare to use. And so I was trying to figure out like, why do we have this question time and why is it being used so much for like how difficult it actually is to, to operate? So we had to dive out into the process of it and we found out that to add a regular drop down question, it was buried inside of this multiple choice question. It was like a different display type. So when people were trying to think of like how do I add a drop down question, they would look through all the question types and they wouldn't know that multiple choices where you'd find adding a drop down and change a setting. Mm -hmm. Instead they would see matrix of drop down and they'd click that. And so I said and the, how we were able to validate that assumption is that we looked through the product data and we found out that 95% of the questions that were matrix of dropdowns were one by one grids of these questions. So people were like using that question and then paring it down because what they really wanted was a dropdown. Uh -huh. And so that was like a question type that we were able to say, okay, this isn't going to come into the new system. And we're going to help migrate some people over. So it was looking at all those sort of assumptions and how things got built and try to simplify and clarify and sort of surface a lot of features that a lot of people didn't realize. Yeah, that's great. When do you guys think you'll be uh, kind of unleashing the, the new Create um, for everyone? Yeah, so uh, because of the scale at which SurveyMonkey works at, it takes a while to sort of validate certain major A-B tests like this. So I think it's going to take three to six months before um, it'll roll out to all new users permanently once we sort of validate that stuff. But you can't quote me on that because anything can happen. Of course. <laughs> of course. But, uh, <laughs> It's it's going really well right now, and so we're really really excited about it because it it's a it's much more woofu feeling mm -hmm. in terms of sort of the drag and drop sort of interface of it, and we've added a little bit of character 
to it. So for example, to teach people, because in the old survey monkey, there's no sense of drag and drop. So to teach people how to do drag and drop, we created like banana targets. And so you can sort of help grab questions and drop it on a banana target. And then like sort of a peeled banana shows up and gives you points and things like that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, I mean, you know, you've grown Wufu, you know, substantially. You're part of Survey Monkey, which is growing substantially. Um, so you've been uh, the reason things grow. You've been around things that are growing. So tell our audience as kind of the last uh, response here. What's the best advice that you can give to any startup or any entrepreneur that's trying to grow? Because the people watching this, they're trying to acquire users. They're trying to retain users. They're trying to get revenue off of users. They're trying to do what you've already done. What's the best advice you have for them? I think I mentioned this earlier in this interview, and I think it is, I think the best path to growth is not to obsess over it. I think people who are sitting around trying to think of like, how do we add viral loops and all this stuff, like what you end up doing is you're growing for growth's sake. And I think if you do this very core fundamental, which is build something that people really want and make sure that people feel satisfied by it, and then you build in processes so that their long-term goals and your long-term goals are aligned, then growth will sort of find you. Like what you end up having is people wanting to use your stuff, they recommend your stuff to other people, and that they don't want to leave. And I think as long as you sort of keep that at part, you'll be surprised at how well, how well and how far that will take you. And then once you get off that path, you know, that's when you'll start trying to do little tricks and stuff, which might ultimately in the long term negatively impact sort of like, is this the kind of company that I wanted to work for? Is this the kind of product that I wanted to build? Is this the kind of stuff that I want my users to think of me? Yeah, sounds like very wise advice, Kevin. So again, thank you for taking time out of your schedule, and thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much.